Hello, welcome to our webinar, The Future of AI-Driven Customer Service. I'm Allison Ryder, Senior Project Editor here at MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. The session is sponsored by Five9. And just to let you all know, the event will be recorded. Re the recording and slides will be available to all attendees about three to five business days after the end of the live event. We cover that on our next slide. We welcome your questions for the speaker today. So if you do have any questions, please enter them at any time on the questions module of the GoToWebinar control panel. We will answer as many questions as time permits. If you're having any audio or other difficulties, please also follow the instructions in the questions module. Our speaker today is PV Conan, co-founder and CEO of 24-7 AI. So PV, I'll hand things over to you. I know you have quite a bit of interesting content to share with us today. Uh, we will open it up for questions in about 45 minutes, but let's get started. That's great. Thanks, Allison. So today we're going to talk about the uh, virtual agent future. And um, I'm sure many of you have gone to websites um, and interacted with bots. And for most people, based on you know, surveys that Gartner and Forrester, the analyst uh, in the space, have done, they tend to be a mixed bag experience. Most of the bot conversation tend to be you know, a disappointment. And today in this uh, you know, session, I'm going to talk about a little bit about where is it today and where is it headed? as well as why some of these bot implementations fail, as well as what uh, constitutes a great bot experience. So that if you, um, a member of the audience is thinking about building a bot or improving the bot that you currently have, uh, hopefully you have some takeaways from this session. So as we begin, um, you know, the first thing is to ask the question, why do customers reach out to brands? And a good way to classify, you know, uh, the types of queries that come in is, one category is what we call you know quick answers to questions this is you know typically in uh, the industry referred to as frequently asked questions obviously as a consumer we don't like uh, frequently asked questions because it imposes a huge amount of you know, responsibility on us to go wade through a you know bunch of documents and search uh, you know links and then figure out you know what we need and that's where you know the virtual agent really shines uh, you know tremendously well because uh, in your own language, you can just say, you know, what do you want? Things like, when will I get my order? What is the interest rate on my car? Or what is your order cancellation policy? And get a quick response. Uh, the paradigm of search, while it works in uh, Google for general search queries, it typically doesn't translate really well with enterprises uh, that are dealing with customer queries because they're very specific uh, to what the customer is trying to do. It's not trying to find, you know, what's the capital of uh, Greece, right? So. Um, and then, you know, you have the other type of, um, you know, questions that come in, which is really completing a task. And here, these are, you know, slightly more complex. And the way to think about the quick answers to questions and completing a task is, in, if this were all dealt by human agents, how many back and forth turns would it take to get the query resolved? So in the case of quick answers to question, no more than one to two turns. So, you know, you may ask, what's your order cancellation policy? And you, you know, the response from you know the human agent maybe uh, you can cancel it within you know um, you know two days before the order is shipped or whatever, and then you may have one follow-up question. If it's less than two turns, you know we classify it as more of what we call an FAQ automation. Completing a task typically takes multiple turns, and you know anyone who's had a conversation in the category that is listed on this slide know that these conversations you know can take anywhere between five minutes to 15 minutes, depending on the complexity and the amount of information exchange that needs to take place. A good one is disputing a charge. We've all called a credit card company and disputed a charge. And typically, depending on the item that you purchased, either the, you know, the conversation ends with something like, no, you cannot dispute that charge, or the you know, agent proceeds to take details and then you know, starts you know, filing a a dispute of you know claim and then you get the resolution several days later so that's why you know when you look at a bot uh, and when a bot doesn't tell a customer what it's designed to handle most bots that are on websites today are actually only designed to handle what we call the quick answers to questions so you know as a consumer when you go into a brand and start handling a more complex query the bot not only gives up it oftentimes directs you to links which you already know exists so there's no big reason why you should talk to a bot to say oh here's how you make a payment or dispute a claim you already tried that it didn't work that's why you went to the bot in the first place 
So bots are almost designed today as you know removed from the website. Bots are not observing what a customer has done in the website. And I would say that you know is the you know beginning of why bots fail completely because they are locked in as standalone channels with no context or understanding as to a given customer's set of issues and what they have done in other channels. Moving on, um, you know, but in reality, what do customers expect? Now, you know, in the last uh, 10 years, uh, we have this phenomenon of uh, a brand new consumer who is used to what we call on-demand everything, right? So, you know, here I've got Uber, which is everyone's favorite example, simple to use, you know, straightforward uh, user interface and, you know, works most of the time without fail. You don't need to talk to anyone uh, other than the driver once you get into the car, right? And uh, similarly, we have you know on-demand movies. Netflix is a great example. On-demand books. So everything that we are using uh, in real life has been turned into on-demand. You get it as you know when you expect, how you expect it, and you have a feedback mechanism in the end. So there's a very tight control loop of you know your expectations versus what was delivered and the fact that the feedback gets reflected. This unfortunately has not translated into customer service. So you know the more uh, parts of our economy moves into an on-demand model, you're going to be more dissatisfied with what happens in the customer service world. And so instead, what do you get when you, you know, turn to a company? You get this assortment of channels and the onus is on you to figure out how these channels work and to make it worse, these channels don't share equal capabilities, right? So if you, you know, proceed further and you look at these channels, some channels can only handle maybe 30% of you know, all the inquiries you may have. Some channels are designed for you know, like complete uh, resolution. For instance, if you take a phone channel, you call the 800 number, yes, you go through a self-service layer, but when you get to an agent, you know, 80, 90% of the time, you actually get your you know, query resolved. That is not the case if you start with Facebook Messenger or chat on their website or you know, chat bots, and that creates you know, a lot of confusion. So what that end result is, moving on to the next slide, um, you know, with this kind of um, differing capabilities, uh, you almost have, you know, other than phone and chat, maybe where you get full resolution. If you start in a in a channel that doesn't support all the intents uh, that a consumer would would like to solve, you end up with in a situation like this. So say pick that, you know, you went through messaging and it can handle 40% of the questions and tasks that you uh, want to handle, by definition, 60% have to hop over to another channel. And that's why, you know, as more channels have come into play, disappointingly for customers, it's involved more effort and more tasks. So uh, ironically, we were better off in 1994 when your only option was to, you know, walk into a physical location like a bank branch or a store or call the 800 number it was a far simpler world, but both of those channels actually worked and you had 100% resolution. Today you have these, depending on the brand, a fragmented set of channels with different owners inside the company who really don't holistically think about the customer. So you've got all these you know, divided experience that just frustrate the customer. The end result is, in, you know, if you're moving on to the next slide, the end result is really, you spend you know, 10 minutes on a channel like Messenger, then you give up and then you, go to the phones and then you go through the self-service channel and then it finally escalates to a human agent uh, when you know like I said you were far better off in 1994 when this would have been just a phone call and an agent and in 1994 not much of self-service existed so you actually got an agent right so uh, remarkably customer service uh, has managed to decline in spite of all the technology improvements and and where we live in an on-demand mobile driven world uh, this is one area that's not kept up uh, you know pace with it so it, overall what we've seen is what it drives for uh, companies is costs have actually gone up as opposed to this promised land of you know more self service easy access for consumers uh, overall costs have gone up uh, customer dissatisfaction is actually higher than what it used to be and this applies by the way to the new generation of on demand companies anyone who's tried to contact uber or airbnb or any of these companies know that their customer service is actually worse than the traditional you know, companies uh, and their resolution tape time takes longer and it's far more frustrating and it's not as simple as it should be uh, compared to their core offerings, which is quite ironic. 
Moving on to the next slide. Um, so how do we solve this? Um, the reality is it's not going to be solved just by you know automated systems. Neither is it going to be solved by agents because as consumers, we have, you know we prefer that things get resolved automatically at a very fast clip as opposed to dealing with you know uh, agents who may take 15, 20 minutes of your time. And so what you need is a combination, a combination where uh, simple to medium uh, complexity tasks get automated you know consistently at a very fast clip. Uh, the channels that are below, which is whether it's a bot, whether it's messaging through Messenger or Apple, Business Chat or Alexa, the capabilities, if they are not close to 100%, you should not be deploying those channels out in the real world because they tend to frustrate customers. If you do deploy them, you need to brand them so that you know customers can clearly understand what they are meant to do. So you have companies you know that have recipe bots, and uh, as the name clearly states, you can only talk about recipes. You cannot ask about anything else, right? So think about, uh, you know, like, you know, as we go through the COVID-19 crisis that we're all going through, a lot of websites will, you know, especially in healthcare, will have uh, COVID-19 bots where it's very clear that it's restricted to the current situation, the current, you know, flu, uh, you know, epidemic that's going on, and how to resolve it, you know, to you know, individual cases that may be happening in your family, but it's well branded it's well understood that you know when you engage with that bot it can only handle one specific type of issue uh, that's not what is happening with enterprises and brands they are unleashing where the bot actually says something like how can i help you implying it can actually help you in you know every single case and uh, well designed companies and you know we'll share some experiences later on uh, what they have designed it is a very simple interaction and if the bot quickly realizes it cannot help with that particular intent, quickly switching on to an agent, but providing all the context of what the customer did on the web, what worked, what did not work, so that the human agent is well informed and picks on the issues at the point where the bot is left off. And what we define that as a, a smooth, continuous experience, as opposed to disconnected, disjointed experience where uh, the next channel that picks up has no clue what has happened in the previous channel, nor is there a recognition of the effort that the customer has put in uh, on the website or other digital assets. Moving on. So here are some examples of bot conversation. First, we'll start with something that's gone wrong. Uh, this is actually uh, you know, a travel website that is implemented in um, you know, Facebook Messenger. Um, and you, know, you could go try this out. It's one of the well-known brands. There aren't that many um, in, the, in the travel sec segment. But you know, here's an example of uh, what I tried to do. I want to book flight to New York, and it says, "Where are you flying from?" And I said, "San Jose." <clears throat> and it asked me, "Where are you flying from again?" So I thought maybe I have to capitalize the J in San Jose, and maybe the bot would, you know, get it right. And then uh, you know, you can see the response yourself. It says, "We're sorry, we cannot search for the same arrival and departure." And then if you keep going on. And now it says choose one, departure city or arrival city. So I obviously picked departure city and again says, where are you flying from? And I say San Jose. So you can see this bot for whatever reason, this poor bot, poor, not well tested. It's uh, one of the you know uh, bots released by a well-known brand, which is a market leader in the US. Uh, and this is the state of affairs of how you know they've deployed this bot. So no wonder it's frustrating for anyone who attempts uh, you know, virtual agent interactions to walk away and think the technology is actually not there yet. Moving on, here's uh, you know, Dish, and you know, Dish is not the only company. You, know, you can go to American Express, you can go to Hilton. There are you know, loads of companies, including Amazon, who have done a really good job of how you know, to implement a bot. In this case, Dish, you know, it says I'm a Dish virtual agent, and it actually sets the expectation. I can help you with many things, but it also says, if I can't, I'll connect you with someone who can. It's a very good starting point of what we call expectation setting. Now the you know, customer who's engaging with the bot knows that this bot cannot actually handle all the things that the customer might need, but you know, it would get me an agent if the bot cannot handle it. And that's you know, what we call best-in-class implementation. And as the bot you know, goes through the conversation, realizes it stumbled into an area where it's not been programmed to handle, uh, it passes it on to a you know, live agent. Moving on. So 
you know, we talked a little bit about the state of affairs. Clearly, you know, the majority of pod implementation is not where it should be. Uh, there are, on the other hand, excellent, uh, you know, cases where the implementation is very well thought through. The customer feedback is very high. Uh, the NPS ratings of the bot in general of well-implemented uh, uh, cases tend to be higher than uh, what an interaction with the human agent looks like. Let me pause and repeat that. The bots get, you know, much higher NPS ratings than the human agents if they are well-designed and well-executed. But a combination of human and uh, uh, a bot well designed and well thought through in general will give you a lift of about 10 to 20 points in NPS uh, compared to you know your current state of affairs where it's you know either a chat or a messaging session with no automated layer uh, that tells you the power of you know if this is well designed it actually is the future and specifically you know like in this current crisis we are in uh, the the call volumes for airlines and hotels are actually you know higher than what uh, you know is normal it's almost peak traffic because many are calling to cancel or postpone their trips and without a you know well designed bot or a well designed bot that's implemented in the uh, you know even the voice channel these companies really struggle so you know it's you know very uh, important that every company and brand think through how about bots are you know leveraged effectively because they are pretty crucial especially in in times where call volumes go up uh, tremendously so let's talk about um, you know the future so you know when we think about um, the future you know human interaction with machines you know it's always about convenience right the number one reason uh, you know consumers choose to deal with machines over humans is always that it's far more convenient and far more responsive and you know speedy and the results are consistent right whether it was the adoption of atm to the adoption of websites to mobile apps it's always been driven by convenience and that will continue moving on uh, you know when you think about your bot you need to think about your brand right i mean your consumer's impression of uh, your brand is greatly affected by the customer service channels and so you know the thing to resist is you know putting all these simplistic bots which are fun for you know your IT teams and your product teams who think they're playing with AI and it's definitely a fun project from a developer perspective but if they're not designed from the consumer perspective it definitely damages your brand you know I gave you an example of the travel brand which you know is a multi-billion dollar company a market leader in the US lots of engagement with the facebook messenger brand and consumers walk away saying this company doesn't really care about me you know it you know it advertises and takes me to these uh, customer interaction channels which are actually not serving me at all so you know you don't want that impression when you think about your brand it has to be you know as good as an uber experience from an ordering perspective not their customer service experience uh, and it has to be flawless it has to be you know consistent it has to be well thought through from actually how consumers go about solving problems, whether it is a quick answer to a question or a complex task like, you know, getting a refund or uh, getting a credit limit increase. So it's really important that uh, the whole flow of conversation, the use of uh, visual, you know, content like you see in this, uh, you know, page, uh, making it easy, logical, and you know, and an ability to ask questions at any time, interrup interrupting the flow. Is our you know key things that need to be uh, remembered as you Im implement a bot uh, if you are you know planning one. Moving on. Now you know another interesting thing is happening as we talk about bots and all the hype around it in the last uh, you know couple of years. Um, you know Amazon has got a strategy around Alexa. Google is uh, you know pushing on with Google messaging which uh, you know if uh, you're a brand most probably they've come and talked to you about you know enabling messaging in uh, you know in search uh, apple has already released apple business chat and samsung has its big speech strategy right so these these companies are kind of coming in the middle and saying hey we're going to broker conversations that you know consumers want to have with you and by the way we have a point of view as to how it should be done for instance apple and google are really demanding that the the, the best practice principles that I described earlier be adopted otherwise they don't want to be part of the engagement in enabling a you know Apple business chat in other words if you go in and you know there is a bot 
you know, if it cannot escalate to a human fairly quickly and with, you know, proper response time, not, you know, 48 hour delays, uh, Apple will, you know, disengage from, you know, allowing Apple Business Chat to be a channel, right? So it's kind of interesting to see uh, these companies trying to kind of, you know, becoming, you know, the gatekeepers uh, from, you know, the consumer to the brand. Now, there are obviously positives and there are negatives. It is for each brand to carefully assess, you know, how they want to keep the engagement uh, with, uh, with their customers. But without a doubt, customers are very attracted to it. So our experience implementing uh, Apple Business Chat and Google Messaging has been very positive from the consumer side. Consumers love the you know, convenience, love the thoughtfulness, love the user experience, and the NPS and the survey uh, conclusions from these implementation is, if it's done well, they'll not only engage, they'll not only you know, walk away very happy with the resolution, they'll keep coming back to the same channel. And this has, you know, of course, wider implication in how companies think, think, think so through their call center strategy, because most brands today have a heavily voice-centric uh, call center strategy. And as the world moves more into messaging and more into interaction with bots, it requires a complete rethink, because most companies are today really not prepared uh, to handle this shift. Moving on. So, you know, one of the things that you may not be aware is uh, most people who are dialing the 800 number of the different brands are actually going to Google. So about 60% of the calls that an enterprise gets from its consumers is through a Google search. So someone goes and says at and 800 number or DirecTV 800 number or DirecTV customer service. And then, you know, lo and behold, you get the you know, 800 number popped up conveniently. If it's a mobile device, you just have to click on it and it's going to dial for you. So, you know, th this means, you know, as Google and Apple uh, make their own steps, and if you move on to the next slide, you can, you know, see that, you know, this is kind of how Google is uh, placing the chat and messaging across the different areas, uh, whether it's organic search, whether you, you know, search for the nearest, uh, you know, retailer, uh, whether you search for a customer service number, whether you search for, you know, a Walmart address, uh, you can see that, you know, um, this is how Google is making sure that messaging becomes, you know, an alternate channel to the voice channel. And Apple has got its own take and, you know, Apple obviously intercepts, uh, you know, a call to a 800 number and actually says, you know, you can text with that, uh, you know, with that merchant, as you can see in the 800 flowers case. So even if you, physically dial 1-800, you know, flowers, uh, you'll get a prompt like what you see in the third section here, which is, hey, 1-800 flowers has, you know, enabled messaging. Do you instead want to, you know, message uh, 800 flowers? So you're seeing, you know, the two uh, big, uh, you know, ecosystems are on mobile at the very same time, you know, encouraging customers to move to this shift. And clearly without, you know, a, a very thoughtful bot, you simply cannot handle the volumes that will come through because you can think about the simplicity and convenience. You can pretty much ask anything you want, get authenticated and uh, start a conversation that, you know, uh, unleashing these capabilities means again, rethinking your call center strategy and being very thoughtful about, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, inquiries you're going to handle in these channels and more importantly, setting expectations, what these channels can do to uh, do for your customers. Moving on, uh, so, you know, our thesis is, you know, industry by industry, this execution of bots and messaging is going to, you know, kind of determine who's who comes out of this race as leaders and laggards. And customer service has always been, and that's why, you know, companies care a lot about JD Power rankings and other types of, you know, industry rankings, because, uh, you know, that score accurately reflects how well you do financially, right? Whether it's revenue growth, whether it's retention, whether it's your cost structure, they pretty much are, you know, well determined by these factors, which means as Apple, Google, Amazon, and uh, Samsung unleash their strategies and as consumer behavior start moving towards messaging and uh, bots, you know, if you're not world-class in that, there's a real risk that even if you're executing other things, other parts of your business really well, being a laggard is not gonna help grow revenues or even retain your customers. Moving on to the next slide. 
And, you know, this has, you know, big impact in the nature of work. Um, you know, we're seeing models where uh, customers are, you know, engaging with bots, but in the behind the bots, humans are helping the bots. There are cases where the humans delegate tasks to the bots and they execute in the background while, you know, the agent is communicating with the customer. So, you know, all these assumptions of what we call a linear uh, conversation between a human agent and a customer is actually going to be a little lot more complex a human agent human customer may be interacting with a, a bot with an agent behind helping or it could be an agent a human agent is interacting with the customer while a bot is helping the agent you know get the get through the conversation faster right it's tremendous opportunity as well as it's you know obviously it's change and changing your workforce to deal with it uh, it, it it's it's definitely something to be very thoughtful about uh, but you know it is coming and it is already you know happening in some of the brands that we discussed where they have done it very thoughtfully. And you know in the distant future, not so far, maybe in five years, you know the, you can envision that you know every customer could have their own personal bot that is interacting with these bots, uh, you know of the different brands. Um, you know so there is you know a, a definite use case that. Uh, as the bots get sophisticated and learn how you interact with these brands, uh, there could be bots that actually serve your needs, and you could have bots, you know, interacting with bots and getting tasks done. And uh, so, you know, it's a pretty interesting world that we are, you know, headed towards. And so, you know, we are in a time and space where, you know, whether it's Alexa or Siri or the other devices around us, everything is listening and, you know, starting to talk back. And clearly, you know, the world will change. But, you know, it's it's a pretty exciting time at the same time for the consumers because we do envision after, you know, um, all the changes that have not, you know, realistically improved the state of custom, customer service, this bot plus the uh, human uh, intelligence paradigm will actually usher in a world of great customer service. And, um, you know, uh, I've written a book on this, so it's called Age of Intent. So if anyone is interested, you know, you can take a look at it. And that pretty much ends my presentation. Fantastic, Phoebe. Thank you so much. This has been really interesting. We have gotten a lot of great questions already. I'll remind people, too, if you did want to input any further questions about any of this presentation, please do so in the questions module. We'll try to get to everyone. Um, I think right now I might be able to. We're very close, so let's give it a shot. Um, one question that, that came up was, was specific to the health sector, health insurance in particular, and I, I guess I'm, I would like to broaden that a little bit and just see, you know, what your experience has been, what have you seen across industry, you know, what similarities are there, what differences are there when different industries are thinking about bot implementation for these customer service type endeavors? Uh, healthcare is, um, you know, a little bit of a challenge because of regulations around HIPAA. HIPAA is the privacy and uh, you know uh, healthcare regulation that governs any interaction between a provider and a patient. So, uh, but what we are seeing is uh, the category of um, answers to simple questions uh, are being dealt by bots, uh, you know, across the board in healthcare. So there are many implementations in Blue Cross to Independence to Anthem, uh, implementing not just bots but also. Uh, you know, helpful tools and asking, you know, questions and getting responses directly as opposed to a search paradigm. Uh, but I would say as a sector, healthcare is definitely behind when you compare it to other, you know, sectors like uh, cable and, uh, you know, media and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Looking into the future, this this is an interesting one for debate. I think we hear a lot about how voice has so much more to do with the future of interaction with our devices. I mean, it's the present of interaction as well, but do you have any specific thoughts on how voice and this customer service messaging might evolve? You were talking about bots connecting with each other, but very specifically on the voice angle. Yeah, so the, 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 the great thing about uh, designing bots, and it depends on what technology you use, but most of the technologies out there support this, uh, you know, is, is fairly indifferent to whether a customer inputs uh, their questions by text or, you know, speech. Some people, you know, um, love the speech mode. It definitely is faster, right? And, um, you know, most bots uh, ultimately will be, you know, 
can be you know spoken to or you know um, can be typed into so you have implementations already like i think in charles schwab and bank of america where you can actually do it in both modes but it again goes back to the fundamentals if the bots are not capable of you know good natural language uh, you know capabilities uh, and you know quick escalation to human agents and knowing the limitations of what it's programmed to handle and being transparent about it those are probably the design practices that need to be thought through but in general the freedom needs to be provided to the consumers in terms of you know where they want to engage so whether it's alexa siri uh, you know apple business chat it shouldn't really matter uh, each consumer would pick one of these channels and stay with one of those channels Right. And what about tonally speaking? I mean, that's a, a thought as well. You know, you think about, you mentioned empathy in one of your mm -hmm. examples. How, how nuanced can these bots be to pick up on tone, to deliver back messages in tones that feel appropriate? So you're not walking away with this perception that a brand doesn't really understand me or care about me because it just felt so rote in the way they responded. Yeah, I didn't talk about, uh, you know, in detail, but one of the things that uh, most uh, companies as they develop bots do is um, they typically tend to design the conversations without any regard to how actual people converse with uh, bots and real mm -hmm. people, right? So what we recommend as the best practice is you take your best agents who are, you know, highly regarded by your customers, take their conversations by, you know, on different intents and then study it because great agents are you know naturally capable of you know are they're naturally good at empathy they're very good at explaining things in a very simple fashion right and uh, they're good at resolving the customer's issue completely so you really don't want to attempt to you know design a conversation the example of the travel one is you know typically like how it goes wrong you someone designed it someone thought a customer is going to go in this flow and you know, often the end result is uh, it goes bad. The other thing is, uh, you know, when you um, unleash a bot to start monitoring where it goes well and where it goes wrong. So it's not a question of training a bot, you know, doing the conversation design, publishing it and walking away. It's an ongoing, highly, you know, tuned, maintained operation that's required and a support system behind it. New intents do come in. I mean, COVID-19 is a great example. It not only impacts, um, you know, healthcare. It impacts every industry, right? And so, for someone to say, "Hey, you know, am I traveling to a destination that's affected by the quarantine?" That's not an intent the bot would have seen it before. So, it's really important to track what new intents emerge, what intents kind of, uh, you know, go away, uh, so that the bot is uh, current. As well as, you know, this applies to your human agents. But when it comes to human agents, especially large-scale call center operation. If your company has over a thousand agents, you're already good at it. So you know how to you know, tackle these new things because call center operation typically work in real time and they work on a day-to-day -day basis. So they take into account weather changes, events that are unfolding, and the agents are trained to handle it. Whereas you, know, you have to give that same care and attention and nourishment to the bots as well. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about there's a, a handoff point, you know, and, and mm -hmm. whether that overtly explicit and that seems to be ideal from the consumer perspective that they see hey I've got a connection to a real person if you can't answer my query that puts me in a state of more restful uh, you know kind of feeling a little bit better about things but is there kind of a methodology to that handoff or a critical point for that or does it really vary situation to situation or could you point to any specific examples of this is how a smooth handoff works this is how the role of the machine interfaces with the human Yep. So I'll give you a, a good example. Most companies, when you start a conversation and it's about your account, they need to authenticate you, right? They need to know who you are. And different companies employ different ways of authenticating you. So, uh, and then, you know, in an instance, you know, in cable companies, you know, they tend to have more complex authentication for whatever mysterious reason, right? And mm -hmm. so they, you know, let's take an example of, you know, give me your phone number. And a lot of us used to, you know, if we had a relationship with a bank for or a cable company for 15 years, we may have had a landline that no longer exists, right? And by force of a habit, you'll say, oh, here's my number, and you give your mobile number. And the bot will come back and say, actually, I, I don't have it in my records, so what is your mm -hmm. phone number? But, you know, the bot is programmed never to break away in most cases. So we always say, only ask the same question twice, right? 
you give a mm. second chance maybe they made a mistake right but after the second instance you give it to an agent and agent says i see you have difficulty in you know, remembering your phone number that's totally fine so the handoff is you break away as soon as it failed the second time the human agent acknowledges what has happened so that the customer feels now they are in good hands right so that those are the principles that you need to apply when you're doing the handoff and it's you know this is obviously a conversation that not many turns had taken place what if the bot had successfully kept the conversation going resolved a couple of items and then get stuck at the you know third leg of the conversation here mm -hmm. it's more important for the agent to get a quick summary so that they can acknowledge what has taken place and then say what is still you know missing uh, from the task to be completed so that the customer feels reassured as opposed to you know the current feeling you get where you go to a self-service channel and then the handoff takes place and the, you know it's like starting fresh right whatever you did in the uh, with a bot or with the self-service system in an 800 number just gets lost mm -hmm. uh, right so that that's not a you know a good design principle right right well to what extent this just makes me think of those ivr systems in general anyway to what extent is that designed, does that come back up in the implementation of a bot chat system? You know, are you thinking, hey, wait, we've got to step back and actually revisit the architecture of that whole phone tree as well, because you're limiting where people can even go. And maybe that's necessitating a tool that maybe we wouldn't need if we had just designed a different architecture more in a more straightforward fashion. So I wonder, do you ever find other ways for efficiency in that customer service loop or system? as a result of some of these implementations? Yeah, it's a great um, you know, question and one we didn't talk about at all in the presentation. You know, The architecture has to be fundamentally changed. Today, uh, what companies do is they design by channel and that thinking is gone. I mean, uh, you're never gonna catch up. New channels will keep emerging. We already know augmented and virtual reality is around the corner. So what you ideally wanna do is uh, you don't design for channels, you have a uh, an abstraction of a self-service layer, an automated conversational layer, and a human-assisted layer when the automated layer fails. Um, and it, that should be able to be plugged in into the, all the existing channels. So I built it once, I deployed in Facebook Messenger, I deployed in Apple Business Chat, I deployed it in the 800 number, I deployed it in the mobile app, in it, enabling both speech and text, giving the whole convenience and putting the choice in the hands of the consumer, right? If it's thoughtfully done, then you don't need to go 15 different systems, you know, one supporting Twitter, one supporting Facebook, or maybe supporting three channels, but not everything. And that, you know, endangers you in the longer run because you're continuously trying to catch up. And then, like you said, go, you know, you, you know if you're gonna update your old phone tree, it's never gonna catch up with the conversational AI breakthroughs that's happening on a, you know, daily basis, right? So your AI systems are gonna get far more advanced than your conventional IVR. But if you just scrap the IVR and you have the capability to deploy that bot in a speech mode, then it doesn't matter at all. So the best in class companies definitely are thinking in, in terms of abstracting this conversational layer away from channels uh, because mm -hmm. that's the right way. That way you're always current, you make a decision tomorrow, you're gonna to support augmented reality or virtual reality. You have to create content uh, for that channel, but your bulk of the conversational layer is still gonna be the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When we're thinking about channels, you know, the message-based communication, which is essentially what this will be in, in any instance I can think of, and I'm probably remiss in missing something, but one question we have from the audience is that the messaging communication has picked up pretty quickly globally. You have dominant messaging apps, you know, they're mentioning WeChat, for example, um, KakaoTalk, yep. but American companies seem to lag there. And do you have any thoughts as to why that might be? You know, um, the WeChat, I mean, you know, there's a whole history about China's evolution and, you know, and the fact that uh, we had a lot more, uh, you know, user base in the traditional desktop, you know, driven uh, internet and China just entered the, you know, conveniently, with the advent of mobile and mobile apps became their world, right? But coming back, uh, you know, in the US, I think um, each channel is kind of like a shiny new toy. There's never been a very thoughtful way of integrating all the channels. But I do think that with the steps that Apple and Google are taking, 
uh, you will see uh, messaging becoming a much, much bigger portion of the number of contacts a, a company gets. Most of our you know, experiences that uh, we have seen, uh, within a month, two months, about 20 to 25% of uh, interactions move quickly into messaging. Not only do they move, they actually stay there, right? Mm -hmm. So I do think, you know, if it's well designed and well executed, it's really convenience, like, you know, that drives all consumer decisions on where they go, right? Consumers are not that attracted to saying, hey, I have an issue with my cable company. Let me go, you know, spend 15 minutes playing with the cable company bot, right? We don't have the luxury of time. So we end up in channels which are more convenient, which are fast, which are quick and consistent. And today, unfortunately, most of the messaging uh, implementations are not there. But like I said, Apple and Google are going to start prodding companies to be thoughtful about it. So I do see you know, uh, that change happening. And it's not the consumers are lagging behind. They're already far ahead, right? right uh, if right, you think right. about, you know, we talked about WeChat, but you think about uh, uh, Apple messaging or Google messaging, that's the predominant way we converse with friends and relatives. Right, right. Or celebrities opening up their phones yeah. or not literally their phones, right? But these phone numbers like text me and who Miley Cyrus will start texting. You, so, you know, but how often is a consumer are you saying, hey, I actually feel more comfortable just taking out my phone and sending a text to JetBlue rather than hopping on the phone because they're assuring me it'll be so much quicker as well. Um, another channel related question that I think it's coming up a few times here. So specifically to this uh, audience member was that a challenge that they would have rolling out an enterprise-wide bot ecosystem would be they'd have to consolidate these multiple kind of one trick pony digital assistants to serve all the needs of their customers and mm -hmm. asking you know what would be the best action sequencing or project phasing to roll something like that out how would you start to approach that yeah i think you know the challenge and you know i do understand the enterprise challenge where you know channels are fragmented they are not consolidated under a single owner and a lot of projects and initiatives are kicked off by you know from marketing to sales to support and other you know units um you know if if there is a virtual agent strategy it has to be driven from the top there has to be an agreement between marketing sales customer service tech support uh that you know there has to be a you know the for for the consumer the bot is just the brand they don't care that your tech support or your you know sales uh, if that conversation is not being driven from the top, unfortunately, you know, it's it's not going to end well. Right, of course. When you think about that too, you know, top-down management oversight, I think another common question we're hearing in different permutations is around the data privacy, data capture, data security. I mean, I guess the first part of this question would be, how much of this is a pure play for data capture? You know, how much are you actually getting from all of this volume of interaction and what opportunities does that create? Yeah, I mean, if you think about conversations today that take place, forget about bots, you know, in the 800 number, whatever conversational data exchange takes place, it's pretty much the same. It's not like you're tracking new types of data. Yes, you could track location data, for instance, but it's helpful in making the conversation quicker, right? For instance, uh, in uh, you know uh, insurance, if you were in a car accident and you call the insurance company or you pick up the app and start messaging, if the bot knows your location, it can dispatch you know you know quickly uh, uh, or you know someone to get your car towed, right? It's a big convenience, but the control is always in the hands of the consumer whether they want to share that data. But even if you take the analog world, you know a consumer will say, hey, where are you stranded? And you'll say, I'm off I-495 near this exit, right? you ended up sharing that information except that in the modern world you can actually track it and you know do other things with it um i do things you know responsible companies and we're talking about companies um you know who are whoever history of you know 50 years or 100 years doing their business they tend to be more responsible with data they do take privacy you know uh, responsibilities very seriously even if they are not regulated right uh, often case the data abuse takes place in what we call the new generation companies where their monetization strategy may not be actually selling a product, right? The data is the product. That's where we see a lot more of these issues and challenges because they, they can get aggressive in terms of, you know, tapping into your conversation. Uh, you know, we talked about, you know, uh, companies that are trying to become gatekeepers. There's always a challenge for enterprises when a gatekeeper comes in who's not charging for that service, right? 
And so these these require you know uh, open honest conversation with those companies to say, hey, how are you handling that data? You know, where are you storing that data? How do you plan to use that data? And putting restrictions on it uh, because that's really important. But in general, you know, what we find is brands are pretty responsible with the way they use data if they actually sell a product or service and have a monetization strategy that's not dependent on data. Right, right. And I'm thinking about how much opportunity there is in that space. And I think it segues nicely into a question we had about build versus buy. I think I can guess what your answer is, but I'll just ask it rather than say that. If you think that the, is it a build, you know, which would be better, a build versus buy strategy when it comes to this implementation? It's probably it depends, but how would you address yeah, that? Yeah, it, it, it's really, it's not really, it depends. A lot of companies have very strong views on whether they build everything or they buy everything, right? And the philosophy is, you know, it's it's really your philosophy, right? It's like, you know, I will eat out every day or I'm going to cook everything with ingredients that I know where it's sourced from. It's a philosophy that, you know, you can you choose to have. And so oftentimes we find that there's also the challenge. Do you have all the right skill sets? And is your company brand able to attract the talent that's needed to build a world class, you know, AI product? Right. And that's where most companies are not realistic. Right. So we see companies that will say, I want to build it because traditionally I've always built it. But if you have not had you know, world-class conversational designers, if you can't attract data scientists to do the modeling that is needed, then you know, you're mm -hmm. gonna have you know, a lot of challenges. So I think the question is really, when you kick off a virtual agent product, how strategic is it? Are you taking it at a you know, centralized macro level to say, I'm gonna take it as a project that affects all consumers across all facets of my business, not just in one area. And then you go into, do, can I attract the talent to build something that's world-class? We talked about American Express and Amazon. They were all built in-house, right? Um, so clearly they were able to go find the talent. In some cases, they did you know, reach out and work with others. So it doesn't have to be a build versus buy. It could be you build and you get support from you know, uh, you know, a specialist who's helping you, but your developers are kind of you know, doing most of the work, uh, but you know, you're getting some outside assistance. So the models doesn't have to be that cut and dry. And let's not forget the core technologies that you're using do come from third party companies. It's not like you built your own natural language, uh, you know, right. model or anything like that. So you are relying on by definition and with other companies, uh, even when you build other things, right? You're just putting in the application layer, the core platform comes from a third party. Uh, and so there you just have to evaluate who's the right kind of third party. If you need assistance, you need help, do they, you know, actually support you or, you know, there are other third parties which are, you know, you go from managed service to here's my platform. You can turn it on. You can use it, but you're on your own. Right. So you've got all kinds of flavors out there. Right. Right. Yeah. And I guess the question is, if you're just getting started, what's your advice or, you know, how situationally dependent would your advice be? I think the, the general advice is even if the bot only has, say, 10% of the capabilities and you want to test it out, make sure there is a logical escalation path to a human agent and that the human agent recognizes what happened in the bot conversation. It's not too hard, right? So even if you want to, like, you know, put your feet in the water and test it out, uh, do the basics right and you'll see your customers will adopt these channels. Right, right. No, it's always a fair point. I wanted to jump back to the strategy conversation a little bit. Um, you'd mentioned in your talk the NPS lift that was a little mm -hmm. bit of a surprising statistic there, mm -hmm. the 20% there. I'm wondering what other KPI, yeah, <laughs> well, you're talking to someone who has historically not trusted bots, so I'm, I'm trying to come around, this is helping <laughs> me, you know, thank you all, this is kind of a good therapy session. Um, but in terms of, you know, I'm curious about other KPIs that you've seen companies using to measure whether it's efficacy, benefit, ROI, and, you know, how much beyond some of those pure, you know, efficiency plays can you get with the KPIs you're able to now implement given that you're doing this approach to customer service? Yep. One of the best metric that's out there other than NPS, you know, at an interaction level, which, you know, gives you insights on how your virtual agent interaction or an agent interaction went through is how much uh, effort did the cu customer put in to solve a given problem? Let's say, you know, you're trying to get a refund, uh, you know, tracking, you know, how much time do they spend on the website, tracking how much time did they spend with the bot? Did they end up uh, talking to a human agent via chat or messaging? And then did they finally end up actually picking up the phone and having to call 
does everything fail? Uh, most companies today don't have a clean method of you know measuring how across channels how much time did someone spend but it's probably the most worthwhile thing you can do is to set an infrastructure to track it because that metric is the golden metric because the lower the effort number is the higher the customers are going to love it and it's pretty you know common sense right if it takes me one minute to resolve something i'm going to love it more than taking me 20 minutes to resolve it talking to three different people and I would call it, you know, a different, uh, a definite, you know, metric related to that is also what what did it cost the company to resolve that, you know, issue? Given the proliferation of channels uh, and more channels coming in, it's really important that you know you take these two metrics, minutes and how much minutes are they spending by intent, and what is the cost, so that you understand the economics of, you know, the different channels. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Completely. I have a couple more questions that are sort of coming from different angles, but I find them really interesting. So I'm going to jump around a little bit so we can get to some of these. One was about market specific. So do you see adoption to AI customer or AI based customer service more in mature markets or growing markets? I think that's an interesting. Yeah, I mean, you know, the consumer is still the same, right? Whether I'm dealing with Uber as a you know, developing market or whether I'm dealing with Marriott, uh, the consumer is still the same. I think uh, I would. I would call attention to the broader trend that um, most consumers want what I call an on-demand experience and everything that they buy and uh, interact with. So just think about that. I mean, you know, that's what is making some of these fast-growing mar- you know, markets, whether it's the on-demand sector, so appealing is, you know, it's really addictive to use uh, Uber or uh, DoorDash or, you know, <laughs> other companies in the on-demand category because it's so easy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a couple of clicks and you're done. And so think about, you know, when, when do you get to a state where every issue that, you know, I need to talk to a brand can be done in two to three steps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I really wouldn't I differentiate think... it between, you know, categories like, you know, why, why can't I deal with my healthcare provider? Like I deal with my, you know, you know, one of my on-demand services, right? So I would say, you know, keep the broader macro trend than segments or whether it's fast growing or not so fast growing. Mm, okay. Okay. Interesting. We were also, some people are asking about, they, we talked about the handoff, you know, bot to agent. Also sort of a different permutation of this, how could bots maybe help agents? In, are there different ways that bots are listening maybe during live interactions and how can they be of value there so that they are, to your point earlier, maybe handing off information that we'd expect an agent to know because we've already delivered it to a system, but not to a human. You know, are, are there ways they can bots can help minimize friction without Absolutely. necessarily being directly customer facing? Yeah, the three areas where the bots are, you know, listening in, whether it's a speech conversation or a text conversation. One is, you know, the emotional cues. So sometimes the agents are so engrossed in their work and you know I, I remember reading this conversation where this um, you know lady calls the calls you know call center and says hey my son has been uh, accepted to Harvard and I need to apply a credit card for him and in this case the agent goes oh okay what kind of credit card do you need you want a rewards card or whatever forgetting that you know the lady is actually quite excited about the fact her son has gotten into college right so a bot could actually cue and say wait you know before you say anything you know you need to uh, you know, recognize that, you know, she's celebrating a little event and her voice shows a lot of excitement. She's happy getting a credit card for her kid, right? So the emotional cues, if they can be missed by agents, a well-trained agent would never miss it. But, you know, the call center world is filled with uh, high attrition. So you always have 40% of your employee base that have been with you for less than 30 days, right? So it is, can be immensely useful for new agents uh, to get this emotional cues prompted to say, don't forget that, right? The second layer is, you know, getting that information for the agent faster than them manually navigating and, you know, get doing it. Mm-hmm. This is an area where robotic process automation comes into play, where, you know, if the data is gathered, a decision is uh, given to the agent rather than them having to navigate five systems and go, okay, you're eligible to, you know, cancel your hotel booking because you're platinum or whatever, right? That's a, another area. The another area is, uh, you know, getting the policy, you know, uh, you know, matters automatically, you know, surface to the agent so they can just click 
and the text goes to the customer. And mm -hmm. another area where the bots help is compliance, right? So mm -hmm. if you're in, uh, you know, let's say you're doing a collections call, it's a highly regulated activity. You cannot make demands of the customer. The, you know, you can only make demands that the law allows. So guiding the agent to make sure that they're accidentally not tripping up on legal regulatory uh, requirements, uh, you know, because they are they are quite immense, and agents tend to forget, you know, if, if they're especially edge cases that happen infrequently, right? So those are you know some of the ways um, you could benefit from, uh, you know, bots helping agents. Excellent. Okay, <laughs> so a lot there for those who are curious about that. Um, <laughs> lots to take notes on and think about and implement for sure. I wanted to end, well, I don't want to, but I feel it would be timely and appropriate to end with a question about our current situation. So a few questions coming in about how you know AI can play a role in business continuity here. Um, you know, any parting thoughts on given what's going on globally, you know, are there some real opportunities for AI for customer service agents to step in? You know, what's what's changed, I guess, in the last even 48 hours. I know, you know, and, and I want to thank you also for taking the time to do this session. There's so much going on in the world. I think we're really, <laughs> um, you know, appreciative of that. And, and people, I think, are happy to tune in and just have something else to think about. But, you know, can we apply this to what's going on right now? And, and if so, you know, what would you suggest there? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a very good question. And I think uh, this crisis is actually going to um, force companies to rethink how, you know, the forget about the bots for a second, even their human agent staffing and spreading across different locations around the world uh, is is being going to be rethought. Uh, one of the things a lot of uh, companies who were hesitant about uh, messaging and chat and had what I call a very voice centric view of the world suddenly recognized if it was messaging, then the conversation could have been done in an asynchronous mode over time with agents working from home, right? Even if they had no access to you know telephone systems and other stuff that they need, uh, if you had an internet connection, you could be helping customers uh, with just a mobile device, right? Uh, and so I've, I've already started hearing from you know customers and uh, people who are practitioners saying, oh God, you know, we should never do this again. We should have a thoughtful strategy around messaging. And obviously bots are one big piece of it, right? Whether there's a crisis or not, uh, I said earlier in reference earlier in the conversation for the last three weeks, call volume for, you know, in the travel and hospitality segment, whether it's airlines or hotels or rental car companies have gone up, you know, 2X to 3X, which is understandable, right? Lots of cancellations, uh, lots of travel restrictions popping up, you know, within minutes, uh, you know, on CNN or other news media. Everything is forcing customers to contact and say, hey, wait, I have a trip point in June. What do I do about it? Even though it's only in you know, a March, right? So, uh, you know, if there was an effective bot, it could have quickly explained uh, all the relaxation and policies that airlines and hotels have done and help customers more in an automated fashion. Today, unfortunately, those customers are waiting for a human agent and worse mm. is, depending on the agent's location, let's say the call center is based in California, I mean, you're not even allowed to go to work, right? Mm -hmm. And similarly, uh, work restrictions have been placed in call centers in Philippines and other areas. So, you know, this is kind of, you know, definitely a double whammy. On one hand, the call volumes are going up, whereas the agent availability is coming down. Uh, so, you know, clearly I think there's going to be a lot of lessons taken away from what we are going through today. Right, absolutely, and that's unfolding every minute. So, you know, yes. keeping that in mind as we think about how we can apply some of these ideas and, and others to to our daily lives now. That's really all the time we have today. So, I appreciate everyone submitting um, some really great questions. Want to let you all know too that in the next few days we will be sending a survey via email. So, we appreciate your thoughts and opinions there. Definitely take those into account as we improve future sessions. We're also going to be distributing a recording of this session and the slides will be made available to you. So you'll absolutely be able to um, gather this information again in three to four business days. And um, that really concludes our program. So thank you all for attending. PV, thank you very much for the thoughtful presentation. And thanks again to our sponsor, Five Nine. Thanks, Take care, Allison. everyone. Bye. Of course, thank you.